Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and this is episode number 784 for September 15th, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. I approached this just like I did my, my hockey career, you know, played every game like it was my last and um, trained really hard. And that's the same way that uh, Dane and Reagan and I and our team approach uh, Belfort Spirits. You know, every day we work hard at this. And um, like I said, we're all in. The global boom in whiskey has attracted a lot of people looking for a second career. And when his first career was good enough to get Ed Belfour into the Hockey Hall of Fame a few years ago, he could have taken the easy path by sourcing some casks and slapping his name on them, just as others with notable names have done in the past. Instead, Ed and his son Dane spent five years learning how to make whiskey and paying their dues. Now, Belfour Spirits is ready to release its first whiskeys, including two ryes and a bourbon finished in Texas pecan wood. In an interview you'll hear only here on Whiskey Cast, the Belfour family also plans to build a distillery. Not in Texas, as that originally planned, but in Kentucky. My conversation with Hockey Hall of Famer Ed Belfour is coming up later on Whiskey Cast in depth. We'll also have the calendar of events, your voice, and on Behind the Label, we'll look at how one distillery came up with a unique way to tweak the flavor of its bourbon. It's all ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Last-ditch talks are set for Monday between Diageo and the two unions representing workers at most of its production facilities in Scotland. Unite and the GMB are both set to start rolling strikes as early as Tuesday at Diageo's Cameron Bridge Distillery in Fife and the blending and bottling facilities in Leven and Shieldhall. Talks between the company and the unions fell apart two weeks ago after workers rejected Diageo's offer of a 2.8% pay hike. The unions want workers to get a bigger share of the company's profits, which added up to more than $5 billion in the last fiscal year. Diageo spokesmen say the company does have contingency plans in place, but would prefer to reach a settlement without a strike. The unions have indicated their rolling strikes could last until at least September 27th. Now, let's update a story from last time around. In our interview with Mike Manjit, the interim director of the Kentucky Bourbon Festival and the executive director of the Bardstown Nelson County Tourism Commission, he denied rumors that the Bourbon Festival would be moving to June starting next year and added this. There has been discussion about, you know, Bourbon Affair tying in that week with uh, Bourbon and Bionic. So that would be another added uh, pressure on us. Well, it turns out that rumor was true. Friday, the Kentucky Distillers Association announced that it'll be moving its Kentucky Bourbon Affair Fantasy Camp from June to September, starting a year from now, as a tie-in with Bourbon and Beyond, the weekend-long music and whiskey festival in Louisville. The KDA is partnering with Danny Wimmer Presents, the promoters of Bourbon and Beyond, along with the Hometown Rising Country Music and Bourbon Festival and the Louder Than Life Metal Rock Festival that take place over a three-week period at the State Fairgrounds in Louisville. The KDA's Mary Gratzer explains. You know, we've had six years now of the Kentucky Bourbon Affair, and 
felt it was a little bit time for a refresh, taking it to the next level, expanding our resources, involving more brands, of our involving more of the community, and the Bourbon and Beyond Festival and the Tri-Festa um, that's now taking place in Louisville every year just seemed like the perfect opportunity to do it. It's, you know, Louisville has been our host city since the Bourbon Affairs inception, so it just made it made perfect sense to, to us all of the stars aligned. So essentially, is this is going to run in between Hometown Rising and Bourbon and Beyond? Correct. Well, um, the, the dates for the different festivals or the order of the festivals may change somewhat based on the acts that they get. But the Kentucky Bourbon Affair will always be the lead in or the opening act is what we're calling it before Bourbon and Beyond. So in 2020, the order is going to be Hometown Rising, Louder Than Life and Bourbon and Beyond because of some acts that they secured. So we will be that week of September 21st in 2020. But moving forward after 2020, the order is Hometown Rising, Bourbon and Beyond, and then Louder in Life. So wherever Bourbon and Beyond is, that's our basically closing weekend. How is this going to uh, coincide or conflict with the Bourbon Festival in Bardstown, which the KDA is also a part of? We are, yeah. We we fully support them. We have two events there just um, next week. We've got what Hall of Fame and All Star Sampler, but I don't think it's I don't think it's a secret um, here in in Kentucky and maybe other places that they're going through some transition. They're doing some strategic planning. Um, I think they're looking at other options and opportunities. So they need to do what's best for them. Uh, we will fully support them in whatever it is, but. I think until they get through next week's festival and can really focus on what they want to do, we just we just don't know what that's going to look like. It's not as though these decisions are being made without any communication. There are KDA board members who also serve on the Bourbon Festival board. Tickets for next year's Kentucky Bourbon Affair will still go on sale this coming winter, around the time Bourbon and Beyond announces its music lineup. And with the Bourbon Festival coming up this week in Bardstown, two more distilleries in the area are adding visitor opportunities. Willett Distillery has just opened the Bar at Willett, offering lunch and dinner on Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, along with a Sunday brunch. And the Bardstown Bourbon Company has now opened its visitor's center with several different levels of tours, including a 90-minute tour and tasting with master distiller Steve Nally. We should also note that there has been a change in leadership at the Bardstown Bourbon Company. Retired U.S. Army Colonel Mark Irwin is the new CEO, replacing founder David Mandel. Mandel will continue to be a minority shareholder in the company. One other note out of Bardstown, Lux Row Distillers will be unveiling the first whiskey to carry the Lux Row name this week during the Bourbon Festival. It's a blend of two 12-year-old Kentucky straight bourbons selected by head distiller John Rempe. Only 6,000 bottles will be available exclusively in Kentucky. Back in March, we brought you the story of Heather Green and her switch from writing about whiskeys to making them as she joined the Ben Milam Distillery in Texas as CEO and head blender. Now, the very first Milam and Green whiskeys are hitting store shelves in Texas this week. A part cask finished rye and a blended bourbon that includes some of the first Ben Milam distilled spirit. I caught up with Heather Green the other night in Louisville. We are playing with very uh, as many elements as we possibly could. Uh, the environment, the humidity, different casts from around the United States, our, di- our distillate on site in Blanco, Texas, everything that was at our disposal to create a really beautiful whiskey. So we're really excited. So it's not 100% grain to glass, it's not 100% source, it's not 100% contracted, it's just the process of making this whiskey was truly driven by what will create the most beautiful taste 
um, that I think consumers will respond to. Let's talk about the rye first. What did you do to it? I know it's MGP rye, right? Yes, it is. So uh, one of the challenges with rye is from MGP is how do you take it and create your own character? What do you do to take uh, somebody's rye, and arguably they're one of the greatest rye makers in the United States, right? So everybody's buying rye from MGP, but what can you do um, to create character, to create a sense of place with it. So what we did was uh, put them in the hot uh, Texan warehouse for three months over one of the great varied climates in the hill country um, from about January, actually a little over three months, from about January until January, February, March, you know, maybe about May, and we continue to keep refilling port barrels with it. And so what we're doing, and testing it regularly, so what we're finding in Texas is that, of course, there's this wonderful... Um, variance in temperature in hill country, day, not, not just seasonally, but day by day. And we're seeing that that really lets the cast breathe in out in a really rapid way. But what needs to get done is that you need to really test them. And what test them all the time until you get that really robust flavor that you're looking for, till it comes out of the cask um, different than what it started with from MGP. And that's what the rye is. So it's rye finished in port barrels from Portugal, but using the Texas environment to create enough differentiation and flavor. And the bourbon is your own, right? Yes, the bourbon, um, the core of this bourbon is Texan distillate that was distilled on site in Blanco, Texas. And it is also uh, blended and bashed with other whiskeys from the United States. So, what, again, it's about finding these casts, putting them together in a way that, quite frankly, great blenders in Scotland have done for a long time. Has this been everything you thought it would be when you took the job? And more. Let me tell you, I'm tired. <laughs> have you adjusted to it? September in Austin yet? Oh my god, it's like endless summer. Coming from New York City has just been really fabulous. Sitting on the patio in the morning with my cup of coffee, looking at the birds and the squirrels and the trees to start a really long day. It's very nice, actually. I'm really, really loving Austin, and the Texas has been really kind to us, um, really opening up uh, their doors to Marlene, Jordan and I, uh, and Marsha Milam, all of us. They have just been really supportive. It's been fabulous. I'll have my tasting notes for the debut Milam and Green Whiskies later in the What I'm Tasting This Week department. Turning now to other new whiskies, the McAllen is adding to its high-end, fine and rare lineup with a new 1979 edition. It's a 40-year-old single-X sherry cask bottled at 57.2% ABV. The U.S. recommended retail price, $14,500 a bottle. Last time around, we mentioned that Suntory was releasing a 2019 version of its award-winning Hibiki 21-year-old Japanese whiskey. Now comes word from Decanta.com that the Hibiki 17-year-old is also being brought back for a 2019 release. Look for prices at around $600 a bottle. Kill Homan is out with the ninth edition of its 100% Isla single malt. It's unique in that the barley comes from the fields around the distillery and is malted, distilled, matured, and bottled at the distillery. 12,000 bottles of the nine-year-old whiskey will be available worldwide. No word yet on pricing. There's also a new 2010 vintage Kilhoman. It's a vatting of 42 X bourbon barrels and three Oloroso sherry butts laid down back in 2010. Once again, no word on pricing. Dewar's is introducing Caribbean Smooth. It's an eight-year-old blended scotch whiskey finished in Caribbean rum casks. Dewar's hasn't done anything with finishes before, but for master blender Stephanie McLeod, it seemed like a natural to start experimenting with rum casks, especially since Dewar's is owned by Bacardi. So we really weren't sure how it would work out. We hadn't really done any finishes in rum before so it was you know it was a really nice surprise at the end when we did actually detect that there was an influence from the rum casks um on our on our Dewar's whiskey because there's always a, a worry that when you finish in something that perhaps the whiskey character is too dominant for the for the, the finish um, but in this case, they've just come together beautifully. So we still get the Dewar's House style, but then there's this beautiful, soft rum aroma coming through as well. 
Dewar's Caribbean Smooth is the first in a series of double-aged cask finishes for the brand. It'll carry a recommended retail price of $21.99 a bottle in the U.S. I'll have tasting notes for it later on. And finally, we'd like to congratulate the legendary Jimmy Russell of Wild Turkey. Tuesday, he and his family celebrated Jimmy's 65th anniversary at Wild Turkey, He punched the time clock at the distillery for the first time on September 10th, 1954, and has not stopped smiling since then. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Keeping American whiskey history and tradition alive isn't just a marketing slogan, it's part of Heaven Hill's fabric. When other distillers were getting out of the rye whiskey business, Heaven Hill saved the legendary Rittenhouse rye from becoming a footnote in the history books. Today it's the rye whiskey of choice, in a cocktail or neat, with a distinct spicy flavor all its own. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. In addition to the Kentucky Bourbon Festival in Bardstown and Bourbon and Beyond in Louisville this coming week, the Speed Art Museum in Louisville will hold its annual The Art of Bourbon auction this Thursday night, the 19th. Forty Creek Distillery in Grimsby, Ontario has its annual Whiskey Weekend this coming weekend on the 21st and 22nd. And the Chicago Indie Spirits Expo is on the 25th. The Stockholm Beer and Whiskey Festival kicks off the first of its two weekends, September 26th through the 28th, and winds up October 3rd through the 5th in Stockholm, Sweden. Whiskey Ottawa is October 4th and 5th in Ottawa, Ontario. Whiskey Fest San Francisco is coming up on October 4th. The Great American Whiskey Fair is on the 5th in Columbia, South Carolina. And Whiskey Live Paris is October 5th through the 7th. The Whiskey Colors Festival is October 10th through the 14th in Dufton, Scotland. And Whiskey Live Hong Kong is on October 12th. Right now, we have 182 different events on our searchable calendar at WhiskeyCast.com. If you have a festival, a tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form at WhiskeyCast.com to let us know about it. We'll be glad to add it to the list. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause, and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in depth is brought to you by Mortlock. This week National Hockey League teams are back on the ice as training camps get underway ahead of the upcoming hockey season. For more than 20 years, September training camps were part of Ed Belfour's annual routine. But after he retired from the game, Eddie the Eagle started looking for something else to do. Back in early 2016, we first reported on the Hockey Hall of Famer's decision to get into the whiskey business with his son Dane. That was when he decided to auction off most of the memorabilia he'd collected over his career to raise the capital for Belfour Spirits. The auction was a success, but we never heard much more about the project until last winter. That's when Scott Burnside of The Athletic wrote a story on Ed and Dane's work behind the scenes, learning how to make whiskey. Now, and as much as I hate to link ice and whiskey, Belfour Spirits is about to hit the ice for real. Ed's daughter, Reagan, has joined the company full-time on the finance side, and their debut releases are about to go on sale in the Dallas area. But one key thing has changed. Instead of building a distillery near their home base in Dallas, they're looking at sites in Kentucky instead. It's a story that could have been one of just another famous athlete lending their name to a whiskey brand, but... It has become one that shows the benefits of paying one's dues 
and trying to do things the right way. I talked with Ed Belfour the other day from his office near Dallas. What prompted you to get into the whiskey business in the first place? Uh, you had a very successful hockey career and could have done anything you wanted, but why whiskey? Well, I think looking back on it, um, you know, Dane was finishing his career at the same time as uh, I was pretty much. And we wanted to do something together and uh, create a family business. So we started looking at different things. And one of the things we looked at in the beginning was vodka. And um, we did our research and it was uh, really saturated. And um, it just didn't seem to fit with uh, what we, our personalities are like. I, I think whiskeys are very uh, unique and very uh, complex and, you know, it, it's a area that I think my creative side can come out. And, um, you know, I, uh, not a lot of people know this about me, but I actually, uh, I took art all through high school. And when I went to college and played for the fighting Sioux, I, I took art in college too. So the creative side for me comes out in our whiskey. And, um, I was a big part of the uh, package that we created. It took about two years and um, that's probably about version 100 that we ended up with. I think uh, the business, uh, you know, the people in it, uh, they, uh, they're a lot like the, the folks that we, you know, grew up with in, in the, our hockey careers. They're very friendly, very uh, open-doored. Um, you know, we've uh, did a lot of tours uh, in, in the neighborhood here in, in the Dallas Metroplex. And... Um, people like uh, Quentin Witherspoon at uh, Witherspoon Distillery, you know, such nice people. He says, come on in guys. You know, I want to show you around and uh, you know, did the tour with him and he, we told him what we were doing. And he said, you know, if you guys want to do an internship, you know, you're welcome to come work here at the, the distillery. And uh, we found that everybody in the business was like that. And uh, it just reminded me of the hockey world. Um, you know, a lot of great people uh, like to have fun and, uh, you know, promote the business. And um, we just thought it was uh, something that we could, you know, see our family get into and who knows how many years that it could last. Uh, the Belfour name could go on for hundreds of years and, you know, be a legacy in, in, in the whiskey industry. So, you know, I love that part of it. And we should note that just as you didn't start out in the NHL, in your hockey career, you didn't start out with a fully finished product here. You did some time in the minor leagues uh, learning, didn't you? Yeah, for sure. Um, just like my hockey career, you know, when I got sent to the minors, I wasn't too happy. But I look back on my career, and that was the best thing for me was to spend those three years playing in Saginaw, Michigan. And then I was with Team Canada for one year traveling around the world, you know, perfecting my craft. And, uh that's exactly how we've tried to do our whiskey business is take it slow and try to learn as much as we can. You know, we, uh, we don't claim to be, uh, experts at this, but you know, we we're very, uh, you know, try to learn every day. That's what I try to do in my career. Every day I try to learn something, try to be better, try to get better. And, uh, you know, I think we've worked hard at uh, creating our flavor profiles, our barrel selections, and uh, like I said, there's been a lot of people that have helped us along the way. And, um, you know, I think that's really important is to always uh, keep learning. Uh, you know, we went to the Moonshine University in, in Louisville and met so many uh, wonderful people there and, and learned a lot from going to that Moonshine University. And, and that's the way we approach every day. Is we're always trying to learn. We're always trying to be better. And we want to create the best whiskey that we can make for ourselves and, and hopefully everybody else will like it you have probably the most unusual origin story for any craft distiller that uh, has jumped into the business because we've talked about uh, a lot of folks who have done this as a second career but not many people sold off hockey memorabilia to fund a whiskey project like you did several years ago yeah so as you know, this business, uh, is pretty expensive to get into. And, um, you know, I, I just, I decided, you know what, if we're going to do this, we're going to go all in and, uh, started selling my car collection too. 
I had about 20 cars and started selling those and I'm down to three cars now. So, uh, put all that money towards our, our business and all my memorabilia. We've sold probably 75% of it, uh, sold my houses, my real estate, you know, like, uh, I, I approached this just like I did my, my hockey career, you know, played every game like it was my last and um, trained really hard. And that's the same way that uh, Dane and Reagan and I and our team approach uh, Belfort Spirits. You know, every day we work hard at this. And um, like I said, we're all in. You have plans that are really now just coming to fruition to actually build a distillery. I know that uh, you've been working to source the original whiskeys, but uh, tell me about the plans to build a distillery in Kentucky and open it up to the public and everything. Yeah. I mean, we were so uh, fortunate to go to the moonshine university, like I said, and then we started doing the, the bourbon tour there. So, you know, we got to visit uh, angels envy and Woodford reserve and, uh, Jim Beam and you know a lot of the distilleries and on the bourbon tour and it just it just uh, you know sold us on that we needed to have our distillery in Kentucky and be part of that bourbon tour um, you know it's it's really important that uh, I feel the best bourbon in the world obviously uh, originated in Kentucky and we want to be part of that and um, you know I I think uh, being on that bourbon trail and you know getting our message out to uh, people that uh, love bourbon and love hockey. And, you know, we, we want to be part of that trail and uh, we've been looking at different spots there. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, been a great uh, experience visiting with the different towns and cities. Uh, you know, they really want us and we, we have like three different great options that we could go to and uh, we haven't decided yet, but uh, we're going to end up in Kentucky one day. I know the original plan was to do something in the Dallas area where you live, though, right? Yes, it was. Uh, and, uh, you know, we did uh, our research here. And, uh, you know, I think it would have been an awesome spot for us to be, too. But in the end, uh, we felt that, uh, you know, making bourbon in, in Kentucky was uh, the best way to go for our brand, uh, both short-term and long-term. Um, you know, all the folks are from Kentucky that, you know, we want to hire and, you know, build the, the barrel warehouses, the distillery, um, you know, all the workforce. They're all familiar with everything there in Kentucky. So it just made sense. Now, it seems that there is a Texas connection, though, with at least one of your initial products, uh, this bourbon that's uh, finished in Texas pecan wood, which is something that I haven't seen a whole lot of used with bourbon. And, uh, I was really impressed with it because it adds a nice little nuttiness to uh, bourbon, which already has some nuttiness, but it really brought out the uh, pecan notes. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And that's what we were trying to do was uh, create something very unique and did some research. And, um, you know, we had uh, uh, an old pecan tree on our ranch. It was probably three or 400 year old pecan tree. And, it kind of inspired inspired me to uh, you know think about why why can we uh, you know finish our bourbon with Texas pecan you know everybody loves pecan products especially here in the south and in Texas so we thought you know what uh, let's do a little research on this let's uh, uh, try some and, and age some in it and see what it tastes like and oh my gosh like uh, when we first tried it like and and the thing about it is it, it tasted good at a young age. And as you know, it's hard to get bourbon to taste great when it's really young. It's, you know, most of the products out there that are great are, you know, older and mature. And, and we were told that too. So when we first tried it and it was, it was just like amazing. We're like, Oh my gosh, we, we kind of got lucky here, you know? So, uh, it's a great product. We wanted to make it nice and smooth and, and that, uh, roasted nuttiness definitely comes out in a nice smoke. So, you know, we're, we're very happy with that product, and, and we definitely wanted to have our Texas connection. Now, where will your whiskeys be available initially? I know there was plans to sell them starting out in Texas and then move out from there, right? Yeah, so we are starting here in Texas. Uh, we actually just uh, got our licensing uh, this week, so we're very happy about that. Hope to be on the shelves here within the next couple of weeks. 
and uh, also Chicago. That's where I started my career, so we definitely wanted to uh, get our products there in Chicago. Uh, you know, we, we're very fortunate that uh, we signed on with Southern Glaciers. So we're very happy about that. And uh, just met with uh, Benny's in Chicago, and we signed a deal with uh, Benny's. So we're, we're so excited to, to be both in Dallas and in Texas and uh, Chicago, for sure. Uh, we eventually plan on going to uh, Toronto and, and all of Canada next year. That's the interesting thing about this. As a Canadian, one would have expected you to do like Gretzky did and make a Canadian whiskey, but you chose to make American whiskeys instead. Why? Well, I, I think, um, again, that kind of goes back to, you know, Kentucky and, um, you know, our relationship here in Texas, uh, you know, winning the Stanley Cup here in Dallas with the Stars, uh, that was a dream come true for me. And, you know, I've spent the, the better half of my life uh, in the U.S. Uh, you know, my kids were born in the U.S. So I think it really comes down to eventually where our distillery was going to be. And we decided that was going to be here either in uh, Texas or in Kentucky. And, you know, we, we came to the decision it's going to be in Kentucky. So, you know, we wanted to make American whiskey. Uh, we, we have two rye products, uh, which, you know, I think, that's our connection back to uh, uh, Canada. You know, I grew up drinking rye whiskey in Canada. That's all I knew. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing. When I first uh, came to the U.S., I went to the bar with my friends, and I, I ordered a rye and Coke. And uh, the bartender looked at me, and he's like, what is that? Uh, and I was like, um, uh, whiskey, Coke? And, and, and he was like, oh, yeah, okay, gotcha, because they didn't really understand what rye was back then. And... Um, so we definitely wanted to, to create uh, an awesome rye product, too. And we have two, our, our VIP limited edition straight rye. That came from uh, Dane's internship at uh, Woody Creek. And uh, he, he made 12 barrels. Uh, I remember him calling me after he was done, and he was, like, uh, sipping on the white dog. And he's like, Dad, oh, my gosh, this is just unbelievable. The white dog is even just amazing. And he was crying. And he was so emotional. And uh, so we definitely wanted to have a rye product, and, and I think we've done a, a pretty good job of creating two very unique rye products. So we're very happy about that. Anything else in the pipeline that you can talk about yet, or is that uh, stuff you have to keep uh, secret until game time? Well, I, I think eventually we, we want to come out with our bourbon. It's, uh, it's aging, uh, and we're not going to bring it you know, to the market until it's ready. And uh, we, uh, we taste test it every couple months. And uh, when it's ready, we'll bring it to market. We don't, we don't want to rush it. We don't want to bring it early. And uh, I think that's an important thing. And that's the regular bourbon as opposed to the one finished in pecan wood, right? Correct. Yep, that would be our regular bourbon. If we have to wait four years, we'll wait four years. What have you learned about this business that you didn't know coming into it that you kind of might have wished you'd known? Uh, all the regulations and, and, uh, you know, behind the scenes stuff that you got to do. Um, you know, I think we've hired like three or four different lawyers and, you know, there's so, so many laws and things that you just don't know about. Um, I wish I would have known more about that in the beginning. Uh, you know, when we first started this, we bought a, a little five gallon still and, um, you know, we were going to start doing all our testing at home while well, we qu quickly realized that was highly illegal and um, I didn't want to be deported back to Canada. So we, we started going down that trail of trying to find the right way to do it legally. And that's when we learned about all the laws and you know, licensing and TABC and all that stuff. And, you know, we wish, I wish we would have known more. Let me close this out. I owe you an apology in public because when we did the initial story several years ago about you auctioning your memorabilia, to help fund this project, I made a joke on the air that perhaps it ought to be called Five Hole Whiskey. <laughs> and I know that's an insult for a goalie. And now that you've come out with it, I owe you an apology because it's much better than a Five Hole Whiskey. Well, I, you know, apology accepted and uh, really appreciate you saying that. And, uh, you know, being a goalie, all those years you hear all those jokes so no worries about that at all <laughs>
By the way, the Belfours have more than 1,700 barrels of whiskey distilled to their specifications, laid down already, and will be doing more contract distilling while they work out the plans for the Belfour Spirits Distillery to be built somewhere in Kentucky. Thanks to Ed Belfour for spending some time with us on Whiskey Cast in Depth this week. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret. Hidden for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies, comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. And let's start off with my tasting notes for the Belfour Spirits Bourbon, finished in Texas Pecan Wood. It's bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose is nutty and sweet with notes of pecan pie, honey, ginger, vanilla, and hints of cocoa and toasted oak. The taste has a good balance of spices and nuttiness, with pecans balanced by white pepper, a hint of cinnamon, ginger, and honey, while those flavors linger nicely through the long, gently fading finish. It's an excellent debut, and I'm scoring the Belfour Spirits Bourbon finished in Texas Pecan Wood, a 93. The Belfour Spirits 18-month-old rye is bottled at 47% ABV. The nose is warm and spicy, with hints of clove, cinnamon, toasted oak, dark chocolate, rye bread, and honey. The taste is nice and spicy with a slight tartness of lemon pepper, along with clove and cinnamon balanced by honey, vanilla, and cocoa notes. The finish is long and spicy with a lingering tartness. I'm scoring the Belfour Spirits Rye Whiskey a 91. Now let's look at the new Milam and Green Whiskies from Ben Milam Distillery in Texas, that we heard about from Heather Green during the news. First off, the triple cask bourbon that includes some of Ben Milam's own bourbon blended with other bourbons. It's bottled at 47% ABV, and the nose has notes of toasted caramel, brown sugar, campfire wood, honey, dark chocolate, and just a hint of vanilla. The taste starts off with caramel and honey sweetness, followed by a burst of black pepper and chili powder spices, while honey, vanilla, and cocoa powder add complexity in the background. The finish, long and spicy with a subtle sweetness, and I'm giving the Milam and Green Triple Cask Bourbon a 90. Now, Milam and Green's Port Finished Rye is also bottled at 47% ABV, the nose is honey sweet with subtle hints of baking spices, honey, charred oak, and a touch of black cherries. The taste is thick, chewy, and spicy with clove and cinnamon, balanced nicely by honey, ginger, dark chocolate, and vanilla with a good complexity. The finish is led by dark chocolate and honey notes with soft spices in the background. I'm scoring the Milam and Green Port Finished Rye, a 92. And let's wrap up with the Dewar's Caribbean Cask Blended Scotch that we also heard about during the news. It's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose has fruity notes of banana, pineapple, and coconut, along with a hint of molasses, toasted oak, butterscotch, and a subtle maltiness. The taste is fruity with grilled pineapple, banana, and coconut, complemented nicely by hints of white pepper, ginger root, lemon zest, and molasses. The finish is long and citrusy with a subtle hint of smokiness. I'm scoring the Dewar's Caribbean cask an 89. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,600 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. And this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey, celebrating the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. 
Visit SagamoreSpirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice presented by Lot 40. One of the really fun things about producing Whiskey Cast is helping you discover new distilleries that are in your own area, but you may have never heard about them until now. I got this email from Robert Polson in Westminster, Colorado. Hello, Mark. Thank you for all that you do. Such a well-produced quality podcast. I wanted to say thank you specifically for speaking to and reviewing Talnua Distillery in Arvada, Colorado. I did not know of them, but after hearing about them in episode 778, I looked them up and booked a tour. Just got back from the tour. It's a very small outfit, but really professional. Patrick gave a great tour and was so personable. I purchased all three of their whiskeys and am looking forward to their Laphroaig cask finish. Patrick informed me was in the works. Thanks again for what you do, Mark. Robert. Well, thank you, Robert, and if you haven't listened to episode 778 yet, I found out about Talnua Distillery recently at a craft spirits tasting in Washington. They're making Irish pot still style whiskey that I thought was really impressive, and it sounds like Robert agrees. And speaking of Irish whiskeys, I may have started some trouble with a tweet the other night. I was sitting at the bar at a Buffalo Wild Wings in Ohio when the guy next to me asked the bartender what Irish whiskeys they had. He said, Jameson and Proper 12. Well, this is where I had to open my big mouth. I said, trust me, take the Jameson. Referred to this in my tweet as a good deed done, hashtag random act of kindness. A few of the responses from Vinny P. At VinP27, saving people from proper 12, priceless. At Bunkai H, so you're saying they aren't often asked which Irish whiskey pairs nicely with your jam and jalapeno wings, laughing and crying emoji included, along with too bad they didn't have red breast. At Michael Drum tweeted, you better hope Connor doesn't hear you say that. Oh, please, Michael. I'll win that lawsuit. Now, I mentioned Jimmy Russell's 65th anniversary at Wild Turkey a few minutes ago. Posted a photo on social media that my daughter Aria took of me and Jimmy a couple of years ago at the American Whiskey Convention in Philadelphia. From our Facebook page, Kirk Pearson posted this note. Happy anniversary, Mr. Russell. I'll never forget meeting him and Mrs. Russell unexpectedly at the Louisville Costco a few years ago. They were both very friendly and gracious. Mr. Russell signed a bottle of Russell's Reserve for me. Then I had to buy another one to open and taste so I don't have to open that one. And John Lown added this, Best ambassador for bourbon ever. Through downtimes, changes of ownership, through the great times like now, Jimmy has always been friendly and a true joy to be around. Amen to that. And if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers all over the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. Our email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all that other stuff that combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. 
Maker's Mark unveiled a new limited edition bourbon this week, and it's the first in what will be known as the Wood Finishing Series. Unlike most of its limited editions over the last 60 years or so, the difference this time is inside the bottle. It's also the first time a Maker's Mark limited release will be available throughout the U.S. And here's where the science part comes in. Most of the time, distillers who want to get fruity notes in their whiskeys will use a different yeast strain in fermentation, because that's generally where the fruity notes are created. But the standard Maker's Mark yeast already produces a lot of fruity notes, so to raise that profile, it meant trying something different with the wood. The distillery worked with Independent Stave Company in nearby Lebanon, Kentucky, and Jane Bowie of Makers describes it as an outgrowth of their private select barrel program. 500 plus saves into this over five years, and we thought, why aren't we bringing people along on this journey a little bit, right? Like, a lot of this stuff, most of this stuff, I would say 99%, like, will never touch anyone's lips outside of our core taste panel at the distillery. But we've been working on a stay for about two years that um, specifically looked at fruit. And the thing is, because Makers has, um, because of the, the yeast strain, and our yeast strain, you know, Mark, you take, like, has that real hefeweizen kind of taste with jug yeast, with the apple and the pears and the bananas and all those yummy fruit with some underlying baking spice notes. Um, we went to ISC a couple of years ago and said, you know, we want to figure out how to highlight those wonderful fruit flavors that people don't really think about a ton with bourbon, right? Everybody kind of vanilla, caramel, and those things are in abundance, and we work hard and love those things. But we, that was fruit was something we really wanted to highlight with those spice notes. And Andrew Webrink and Brad Boswell kind of laughed and said, like, you know, fruit only comes from, you know, fermentation, and really esterification during oxidation and maturation. So, you know, trying to actually pull fruit and highlight fruit, you know, it, it's just, it's a hard ask. Um, and so we started working on this save, and two years in, we've actually found it's American oak, and it's um, seasoned actually a little bit longer, so it changes the acidity makeup of the wood, which actually, and you tell me if I'm getting too in the weeds with this. Um, nah. I would have thought we would season shorter amount of time for more acidity, but actually when we did that, it had the reverse effect. So it's an 18-month seasoning on the yard, and then they're actually um, putting it in a convection oven at a pretty medium consistent temperature for hours and hours and hours. So it's not too dissimilar from our P2 stay, if you're familiar with our private select offerings. But the temperature is slightly elevated, and what it does, and I, I can't wait for you to taste the whiskey and get your opinion, um, it actually kind of blocks some of the traditional sweetness, and it adds this bright high note, and all these big fruit flavors come through with this underlying baking spice. And then the classic maker sweetness, like, brings it back in balance, but it's almost kind of the opposite of what 46 does in some ways. It just shows a different side. And it's one we have worked hard on. Stave profile RC6 is the official name for the bourbon, and they only made 255 barrels of it. It's bottled at a cask strength 54.1% ABV and will have a recommended retail price of around $60 a bottle in the U.S. while supplies last. It just shows that there's more than one way to use the handful of ingredients to tweak a whiskey's flavor. And thanks to Jane Bowie of Maker's Mark for explaining it to us on Behind the Label. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. A unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. 
That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, whiskey photo of the week, cocktail recipes, and a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. Want to make sure you never miss a single episode? Just click on the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app, whether you use Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or another app. That way you get every episode as soon as it drops. By the way, you can also listen to Whiskey Cast on your home smart speaker, too. Yeah, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. My email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.